Not there. Bowie. You got it. Okay. Coming to you in five, four, three. Hi, Juan. Hi, Juan. Hey. <laughs> it's good to be Hi. here. And it's Thanks. good to have you here. Thanks, Juan. Or as I say, it's good to be seen. Good to be seen. Good, good to, to see heard. you. Yeah, well. And good listen, to be heard. Listen to. Yeah. It's good to be listened to. <laughs> Juan, we wanted you to come on Art Happens TV and demystify comics. Can um, we do this comics, in minutes? Comics, graphic novels. Well, they have so many different <laughs> names now, but it is still essentially. I don't know if I can essentially demystify can it. It's it? hard, but we can crystallize it, just like good, especially comics in Pittsburgh. So let's start. Oh, okay, let's go to the beginning. Of time. Of time. How? Hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics. Caves of Lascaux. Giotto. <laughs> yeah. Yes, thank oh, you. Yeah. Comics. How did you get into comics? Are there other art forms that you were into before comics? Like, tell us a little bit about yourself. Bob. Yeah. So set the stage. I'll set the stage. I'm in a snowy bedroom in Cleveland, Ohio, <laughs> cutting paper, listening to a stereo, have an issue of Sandman open. Um, I have YouTube vloggers talking because I'm young. I'm a baby. Um, and anyway, in high school, just experiencing a lot of like different media and just wanting to do everything. I wanted to learn how to play bass guitar, but I have no motor coordination. I want to be great at skateboarding. I have no motor coordination. Um, <laughs> so that means you don't ice skate either. I don't ice skate. I don't <laughs> snowboard. I don't jet ski. Um, I do skateboard. Um, but it's this thing of, uh, it's a very like personal practice, whereas in like music, my appreciation of music is a very personal thing. But then comics is a thing that's personal and public. Um, right. So mm -hmm. I can tell you the story of really like opening myself up completely to comics and just like turning my brain into a comic sponge. And that story really starts, if anything, here in Pittsburgh. Um, like I, I nice. read a lot of comics mm. like through like the libraries in school and like my school libraries too. And I'm talking, I'm talking about like elementary school with that essential Spider-Man like on the bus. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, we've all done that. And then um, in high school, I was of the age where libraries were actually buying comics, and it was in the early boom of when a lot of publishers were latching onto the term graphic novel mm -hmm. for this literary legitimization of the form. Um, so. I got to read a lot of comics in the library, um, which is great. And there were some things that I was coming across. I was like, I'm just not interested in like uh, these like superhero stories because it's just like figures in space moving around doing stuff. I'm not, I'm not interested in that. It's not right. doing weird stuff to my brain. It's not weird enough. Um, so then there are a lot of collections. There's this like kids collection that I really like called Flight, um, edited by Kazu Kibuishi um, and a bunch of other people. And then a mirror to that but done by this American publisher based in Seattle called Fantagraphics. They were Fantagraphics? Fantagraphics. Mm -hmm. They were putting out this um, collection called MOM. It was an anthology, came out quarterly. Um, and it was something really- How do you really spell that? M-O-M-E. Like Edith Mom. Piaf. La MOM. MOM. Yeah. Le MOM. Yeah. Um, and it was a wonderful collection that had like interviews and it was perfect bound, like a trade paperback, had that I ISBN number. So libraries like bought it up and they did a full run of about like 22, 23 issues, and um, I was just absorbing that. Like, this is really cool, but I didn't know of any places that like people made things, sold them, came together, places of convergence. Um, that's what I found here in Pittsburgh through Copacetic Comics. Mm -hmm. um, and that was in, I would say, like 2009, where the owner, Bill Bushell, was in Scroll Hill. And then I was like in school, um, studying at Carnegie Mellon uh, Linguistics, and so it ties to comics too, but um, I, I was just trying to find like new things that I couldn't categorize, and Bill had all of them. Like music, movies, comics, he calls the place, Copacetic Comics, an oasis at the crossroads of culture, um, and <laughs> like that's what it is. And so I go there every week now. Now he's located in Polish Hill, mm -hmm. um, in the Polish Hill Punk Mall. Um, we got Lily Cafe, uh, what used to be Mind Cure Records, and then uh, up at the top, Copacetic. So you can read some and comics. I think, I think he originally was in Wilkinsburg. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bam. Yeah, yeah I, I used to go back in the day. All the time back in the day, day. Yeah, and that, he was a pioneer in terms of the selection that he had, of course, like back issues. And he he had everything that you would want in terms, like, he's, he's one of these, like, expert nerds, like, uber nerds in terms of, like, 
how to categorize things, how to ship them, all that stuff. But like, that's only one of 800 other compartments of his brain. Right. Um, which is incredible as a bookstore owner. And stuff like it's also really um, super important what you're saying in terms of artistic influence that I think about physical locations and encountering people as so important to creative process, more so than the internet. I mean, we talk about the age of information and you can access stuff, but really for me, it's always been libraries for sure and bumping into people and just talking to them. Like, about you know, being in the old photo shops and asking people about paper and chemicals. Or going and how to comic book stores and, and meeting other fellow mm -hmm. comic book nerds. Or a place like yeah. Taliban or something like that. And, you know, and striking up conversations and hearing about mm -hmm. some kind of yeah. book you haven't read, you know, sharing that kind of and knowledge. I, I exist in this like digital, physical uh, existence that like, we all have, but I think because of like how I grew up, more so than most people. And that I think sometimes people romanticize those, like talk about physical print, all those places, but I don't think you can speak to the importance of it. Even, even if you are romanticizing it, it's essential. Um, and I wouldn't be the person I am if it weren't for random encounters that I made at bookstores, mm -hmm. at the library, on the street, going to somewhere, whatever, like just catching up. Um, it's huge. And with that store, and like a lot of other bookstores here in Pittsburgh, what's nice is all the programming that they do, but could just going into that timeline of Wilkinsburg, um, Bill Bushell used to do this anthology that he, he had a copier in, in house, right? I remember that. I forgot yeah. about so that. Yeah, so uh, uh, he was reselling old comics like Charlton, like old Golden Age comics too. Um, and then bringing in kids, giving them an opportunity to read, adults too, but more so than anything, it was just like people didn't have anything to do. It was like the late 80s, I mean, people had a lot of stuff to do, but like it was a safe place to be, hang out and be yourself and just like talk about whatever, learn about whatever music. And he published. So like people, he, like, and he did whatever, he like sometimes would like write scripts for kids to work on. Um, and there was a really like, strong crew. And there's been what I think is really beautiful at this new location in Polish Hill, through the kind of culture that has been created around that space of copacetic comics, an entire community of makers that have gone on to become who they need to be, but are tapped into this, uh, into, like just space of intersections. And yeah, I think you, when you talk about uh, spaces, um, I felt like it was a haven for me. Like you know, we we're talking about the '80s. There, it, there was not much to do, so you comic book store was like a, a lifeline, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so I'm so glad that he's, even though he's traveled throughout the city, he still has this this space. It's kind of, um, it's a really interesting legacy. Yeah. yeah. And, and like, I, I take that entirely as my, my practice, just like being part of that family and that culture. And the, one of the fundamental tenets is people before profits. It's a store, but that's, it's, I mean, like, you gotta stay open, but that's not why it exists. Right. Because if you wanna make a killing, sell books on eBay. Right. Like, don't, don't have a brick and mortar. Um, so just speaking to that. Why engage with humans? Why engage with humans? <laughs> yes, when you, why? You know, just <laughs> accounts that you like ship objects to. Yeah. No, <coughs> pardon me. Oh my God, it's fall and allergies. Mm -hmm. Sorry, people. <laughs> um, when I was doing comics way back, right, uh, we could never really imagine, I mean, there were animated television shows, but we never imagined the kind of industry mm -hmm. that just has exploded from comics yeah. and graphic novels or whatever you want to call it. Like, there's movies, there's toys. I yep. mean, like, not just toys, there are stores with all the toys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and now, I see comics as not just like this space of commodified genres, um, the like, stories that are turned into other media, but fundamentally it's uh, a traditional narrative that fits within a framework of fantasy, science fiction, mystery, romance, um, characters that you can like name on your hand, or maybe it's a crazy Jack Kirby story and like it's a whole pantheon. But fundamentally, um, there are these stories that get packaged and get repackaged in different ways. I mean, 
comics at their essence are commodified culture and they don't claim to be anything other than that. So they exist and play with those tensions existing as a capitalist art form, um, but they exist in a way that allows for subversion within that form and I think that's really exciting. But where we are now in 2016 with comics compared to 1986 where you could have an explosive hit of a black and white comic like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles yep. that just exploded. That is still going. It's still going, still right? Going. And so uh, comics are a really interesting place, I think, to talk about intellectual property. Um, we see it in animation, we see it with like Disney, we see it with all these other things. We see it with corporations too, with mm. logos, color schemes, all that. But with comics, um, the essential materials that you need to create something that can become an intellectual property is copy paper, a Pentel Rolling Rider pencil, or a Bic, just a Bic pen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Draw it. A Sharpie. Draw it in a way, like suddenly you create something that sears itself into the consciousness of another person. Comics can do that, and all you need is a photocopier, a scanner, or nowadays, like a smartphone with a camera, put it online, and suddenly you've created something that other people could uh, cash in on without consenting you. Like maybe you make a really cute looking little piggy. Make a cute little piggy. Um, someone really sees that it becomes super popular. A plushie maker wants to make a cylindrical uh, pillow based on your design. They don't consult you and you just created something that is gonna sell hmm. thousands of dollars worth of merchandise. I would have and, never thought of that. Mm -hmm. But you can do that now. Like and now we used to talk about newspapers as the primary form of publication for comics. But now with the internet and especially now with um, this kind of like decentralized image capturing network that we have with mobile phones and with the social media apps and just blogs that you can get those photos onto with immediacy. You draw something, take the photo, put it online and people are experiencing it. Hmm. Like you don't need to draw it, send it to your editor. They do like photo stats that get into the newspaper and then it comes out the next week. Hmm. But there's something in what you're saying, um, how it ties into uh, intellectual property because while you have this immediacy of being able to share your work, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily protected. Yeah. In a right. sense, you know, there's still different kind of proposed bills out there mm -hmm. that it could be considered an orphan work and up for grabs right. to become that pillowcase that sells. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, but also that yeah, the comics are operating on multiple fronts, right? Yeah. So you've got something that used to be almost exclu exclusively in the newspaper that now can be reproduced in multiple forms, right? As a plastic doll, as something in a Happy Meal, as, as an animation, an animation, as a pillow, as a graphic print on a curtain. It's a syndicated series on Adult Swim. It could mm -hmm. go on the side of my glasses, yeah. whatever, yeah. you know. And I think that um, that's kind of interesting to me because I think that identity-wise, I've often found it really interesting. Of course, we live in Pittsburgh where we have Anthrocon and Comic-Con and all these things where there's an identity with character that often is kind of amazing to me in comics because I relate to comics like their stories, so I, I read them but I don't necessarily relate to necessarily characters. And sometimes- Oh, really? I know. Oh, I'm sometimes totally like I'm Silver like, Surfer. Yeah. Right, <laughs> right. And yeah. I get it, I get it. And, and um, I get it, but I don't do it myself. Yeah. Yeah. So I find it interesting. So, so talk, to speak, to something I that. struggle with as a maker, um, and I say struggle with it, and I should throw that word out the window because I'm just not interested in it. <laughs> get up, get out of <laughs> Get out of here. We're is, done struggling. Is those traditional, like, Kurt Vonnegut type structures of narrative. Uh -huh. I don't like, I don't care about them that much. Um, right. I like to experience, um, like, little microcosms of worlds and narratives, and I want things to evoke stories more than to tell me a story. Mm -hmm. So, and so that's the kind of work that I make. I love comic strips because of that. Um, and just for, for us here, like what I love about a comic strip is that you could create a strip, um, call it Cozy Town, and then have a full week's worth of um, unrelated stories. And maybe there are some characters that reappear, but not in all of them. In the reader's mind, maybe one reader reads it on Wednesday and, and on Friday, and then somebody reads it all days, and maybe one person only reads one one week and another one week. 
everybody in their minds, each one of these comics functions as a little star, and they're reading all these things. And in their reading experience, their brains are connecting the space, not just between the panels, but between the strips. And because it's nonlinear, they get to create their own system of constellations. So meta, Juan. Well, and I think it's really beautiful, and you can yeah. do that. And it's really exciting for me as a maker to be in this space in 2016 where like, I can do that. Mm. You know, I'm not interested in making big, hardbound books um, because I know that not many people are going to engage with that. And some will, and if I do a great job, I'll, I'll win the, like, the National Book Award and blah, blah, blah. Heather MacArthur, like, whoa. Like, if you do a great job, mm. as many comics makers and cartoonists have, but that wasn't their end goal. Their end goal was trying to communicate and there are different forms within this thing that we call comics. And something that I want to talk about to demystify comics. Do it! Is when we, when we were joking early on, like, hieroglyphics, cave of last go. Yeah, it's real um, though. It's that real. is where stuff comes from. Yeah, and not only that though, but the thing that we call comics, I think is um, we can expand the definition in a way that starts to bring in a lot of experiences that aren't storytelling and character based, um, but communicate something. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think comics um, fundamentally are when you have images and text and there's a tension between them mm -hmm. in some way, whether they're polarized, they're synergized, they're moving together in some kind of way, that's comics. So I can look at a newspaper and how it's laid out in that information experience, that's comics. I can look at a billboard, that's comics. Some people will say, that's graphic design. No, but not only that, because if you just think about that traditional Juan's claiming. group based, he's claiming. I'm claiming. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, because you can Plant look at the all these flag, traditional Juan. grid based systems sure. that graphic designers have been using. Yes. But comics are, can do more than just that, more than just relay information. Mm -hmm. um, or sell something. Or sell something, or create a space for an emotional experience, as some like graphic designers like to, like to work with. Um, but it's, it's in. What's well, like the Mayan tableau, right? It's, yeah. In some, it's a giant comic book that people mm -hmm. still are not capable of deciphering yeah. the messages that are in there. So The codices, yeah. The code, thank you. Yeah. The codices. Yeah, and you, you have that. And right now when we see people texting with um, emojis, yeah. interspersed with words, there's, there is a visual tension. Like that little chicken after one word will mean a totally different thing if it's after a different word. True. Um, and so what, what is that? comics. And, but it's not in word balloons and it's not in grids, but you're arranging things so that they have this kind of like semiotic kind of communication. Yes. And, and you can use all these other systems, um, but that fundamental aspect of tension between image and word, that's comics. And you can do it in a way where it has word balloons that allow you to know who's saying what, what's saying what, because maybe it's a rubber you ducky can talking. Sort of direct yeah. the, right, direct yeah. the reader and the viewer. Yeah. So Which, you're you're busting through this. So yeah, I also you, I you know um, how Bam! do you teach this? Because I know <laughs> tell us a little bit about what you do with um, well the speak, organization. That yeah, um, with I teach in a lot of different environments because and I mean this notion of comics as tension between image word allows everybody to experience comics and make them. Um, I've taught in ways where there's like ready-made material, so collaging um, where you're cutting out words, putting some images together, putting an image on top of an image and creating that. And that's really great for people who are reluctant drawers. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've taught youth um, from kindergarten up through high school. I've taught like college students, um, adults, like here in the Carnegie Library System that have like great opportunities to teach there. Um, and it's all based on I, I usually think of um, what, who's coming to the table. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of like lessons that are scaffolded to allow different things. Like we have these regular gatherings called the Pittsburgh Comics Salon. And at those gatherings, we meet at a couple different places, the Museum once a month, the Lily Cafe, Biddle's Escape. Um, and with all these, like at that event, it's a lot of people who are either aspiring makers or already makers who are just looking to work in solidarity with other people. Mm -hmm. So whenever I'm preparing an exercise, an activity for them, I know for the most part what they know and what they're comfortable with. So I like to make them do things that they're not comfortable with. Right, to learn and expand. And for people who claim, oh, I don't, I don't draw. I haven't drawn in a long time. It's like, that's okay. 
that's totally okay, but you, you can draw. Sure. And so there's this thing that a lot of people haven't done, and because of how we handle education in the United States, a lot of people who didn't spend a time in arts education sphere with drawing have never really experienced this idea of connecting your eye with your hand, mm -hmm. of contour line drawing. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful thing, and it's really simple, and it can lead to so many other things. So with a lot of adults, that's what I'll sometimes ask them to do. Um, I'll like place an object there, and I just ask them, like, blind contours are great, because they can I yield really them. funny mm -hmm. things. Yeah. And so especially to break tension in the space, um, that's really nice. Even though people are like, I don't know, that's a stranger, I'm not gonna draw them. Um, but you have them draw, and the drawing's hilarious. Um, but there's also some really lovely um, hand-eye coordination that they're building. And I speak earlier about my lack of motor coordination. I have good hand-eye coordination when it comes to like these like small movements. Yeah. But I can't. I can't do like a like a pop shove it and land with like on my nose, or I can't like play the cello or a bass guitar or anything like Yet. that. Yet. Yet, yes. <laughs> I, have, I have this other kind of coordination, you know? Yeah. And, and I think that everyone can develop it, just as in like... It's your get, superpower. It, well, we all have that superpower. <laughs> That's um, cool. But I've honed it, right? It's just like we all can become more appreciative of the sounds and the music that we hear. We can become more appreciative of the images and the words and the tension between them in the world around us. And so you that's know, what I like to teach. There that's are bass so players cool. who can't do comics. Just it's, so true. You know, it's true. It's true. It's true. Just put it out there. But, <laughs> they, they, but I'd like to. I'd like to make some comics with them. Hey, there yeah. we go. An exchange for lessons, maybe. Yeah. So one, obviously, you're super passionate about comics. Super. And I have a question for you. So, how? Two questions. You're going to have an upcoming show mm -hmm. at the Greater Pittsburgh Arts Council, mm -hmm. and you and Christian are cooking that up. So could you guys tell us about that? And where can people find your comics? Sure. Um, so, for this show that we're doing at the Greater Pittsburgh Arts Council, it's going to focus on process and this expanded notion of comics as this like modality that so many artists in Pittsburgh work in. Um, so, we want to show how wide a, like a spectrum we have here locally. That's in my experience, traveling around the country, selling comics, um, just like interviewing people, like for a couple of just publications, it's incredible what we have here and the number of comic shops that we have here that foster this appreciation of this mode of storytelling and of communication. So we want to showcase that. Um, and it'll be during the January gallery crawl downtown. Mm. Um, and what'll be exciting is that there'll be work of artists on display. Imagine um, one page finished in a book. Maybe the whole book is like opened up, framed against the wall. And you'll be able to see the process of how the artist created just one of the panels. They were doing thumbnails yeah. in a sketchbook. Then I they refined it. that. They lightboxed it. Or maybe they did it all with 3D modeling. Or maybe they all did it in one take. And it was a very, like, a Japanese calligrapher. Like, <laughs> and that's all that they did. And instead, their inspiration were, like, stills from Escape from New York or something <laughs> like right, that. Right, or anything. But, or anything, because everybody's processes are totally different. So we'll have that. You can meet the artist. You can I experience love it. the work. Um, and demystifying you, comics. Demystifying comics. Thanks. And then you can also go around. We'll have some books on sale um, of the artists on display, but also a wide little selection, just introducing a lot of Pittsburgh's gallery crawl Like a pop-up bookstore? Like a pop-up bookstore. And then yeah, the comic salon. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I, love that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I didn't know we were doing that. Yeah. We are. Can you tell me that part? Well, let me clarify. I, I, I want Let me to clarify. Tell <laughs> he's cu he's curating it. He's doing the book. I yeah. just I just like, hey, you're here. You're new to GPEC. We all love comics, so want to do a comic show. So right that's on. really, I love that's it. Really him. I have to thank, <laughs> I, but I have to thank you for helping me spread my wings. Of course. Yeah. Now, Juan, tell us where can people find your work. People can find my work at JuanJoseFernandez.com. I was really lucky to get that domain. Wow. It's that's a common name. Um, Juan Jose Fernandez. Yeah. Mm -hmm. com. Dot com. Excellent. Do we, do we need to spell this out for people? J U A N J O S E F E R N A N D E Z dot com. Oh, and speaking, wait, you won an award. I did. Yeah. You won an award. Yeah. Wait, you tell us. We've got Fuerza. 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 I'm sorry for mispronouncing it. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
tell us about this yeah. award. Yeah, um, that was. And congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That We've was got just a moment left. So yeah, let's in this wrap last up moment, with something fun. Yes. That was um, an award that I received from Cafe Con Leche, yes. um, and, like an amazing organization here in Pittsburgh that's helping um, just create the like a really strong framework for the community of Latin Americans. Um, to come together um, because there is such a wide spectrum of like what it means to be a Latin American you know in the United States maybe you're um, you're from Los Angeles and you've like moved to Pittsburgh or maybe you were born in Cleveland but like both your parents were Puerto Rican um, or maybe you just moved from Mexico here whatever it is um, Pittsburgh needs a space like that where people can come together um, and, and really just experience the city, but have the resources that sometimes aren't available widely to help someone who comes from Central or Latin America or from just anywhere here in the United States to make life in Pittsburgh possible. I love it. Language so, is huge. That's so yeah. amazing you say that because last night, it was Thursday, wait, when was it? Monday? It was yesterday. Monday. Thank you. <laughs> Monday night, and um, I forget the show, but it's a, um, a Latin show. And they were talking about Puerto Rico, and they were talking about resources. Uh, they had the former president of LACU on. Mm -hmm. And they brought up this issue about resources, and they did the research, and it said that if you are new to Pittsburgh, it takes you up to three years mm -hmm. to find the resources that you need. So this is really well, pretty Juan phenomenal. Well, Juan is so, our resource for comics mm -hmm. and fabulousness and we want to thank you for being on the show thanks with us for being congratulations thanks for, the for your talk. fuerza Ooh. award congratulations thank you. we are looking forward to seeing your show yeah thanks ciao ciao au revoir au revoir, au revoir. i'll see you soon